Yes. Bob, <laughs> why'd you do that? What? Record four minutes of silence last week. You're supposed to tell me when I don't turn my microphone on. You're supposed to throw something at me. <laughs> That's true it is. That's true it is. Especially in my case. So, um, All right, Ephesians chapter 4, we'll read uh, just a verse to get started, and which is kind of our topic for this uh, series of studies. Ephesians 4 and verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Let's bow our hearts now in a word of prayer. God and Father, <clears throat> again we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking to your word and studying together this evening as we do so. We pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ and be edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, we started last week um, to study baptism, uh, and, and <coughs> we're going to go through scripture and study uh, the various types of baptism. Last week we just uh, took some time and went through, I think there were 14 different baptisms that we identified in scripture. Um, and depending on how you divide them up, you know, you can combine some of them together because they're very similar, but there might be one little characteristic that's different. So depending how you, you categorize them, um, you can get as many, I think, as 14 baptisms. I've never seen anybody list any more than that. Um, but you know, so, so for our purposes, we're going to look at 14. Maybe uh, if some I can't figure out or combine together, we'll take it down. That one in 1 Corinthians 15 is still a stinker. Um, so we'll see. But Keith sent me his, an explanation of that this week. So I haven't read it yet, but I'll, I'll figure it out um, once I read that. So uh, we started off with, with also... Uh, um, uh, defining, that's the word I'm trying to say, defining baptism. And so there are, are, are different ba uh, uh, definitions of it, but the word translated baptize or baptism in your scripture generally means to emerge, to immerse or submerge, or to make whelmed or overwhelmed, to make fully wet. And the idea is that, that you are immersing something in something uh, to identify it with that thing, and w if that makes any sense, too many things in that in that sentence. Um, but we, uh, I found a uh, an explanation of it with a quote uh, from, uh, and I'll just read the quote. The clearest example that shows the meaning of baptizo uh, is a text from the Greek poet and physician Nicander, or Nicander, who lived about 200 BC. It's a recipe for making pickles, and it's helpful because it uses both words. Nicander says in, that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable should first be dipped, bapto, into boiling water, and then baptized, baptizo, in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the immersing of vegetables in a solution, but the first is temporary, and the, sec the second, the act of baptizing the vegetable, produces a permanent change. So I thought that was a pretty interesting way to describe it by using the Greek words in some totally unrelated thing that when you're making a pickle, so whatever the vegetable may be, let's say it's a it's a cucumber, you take that cucumber and you dip it into the vinegar and the spice solution and, and it takes on the characteristics of the vinegar and the spice. It's not a cucumber anymore, it's now a pickle. And you know, if you take a bite of a raw cucumber and you take a bite of a pickle, obviously it's very different. And you can make different kinds of pickles. You can make sweet pickles and dill pickles and bread and butter pickles and you know, depending on what solution you dip them in. So baptism is about that identification. It's, it, it has the idea of dipping and immersing and submerging, which of course is where the water comes in. But as we saw last week, a lot of the baptisms in scripture really have nothing to do with water. But they all have to do with identifying. So you become identified with some person 
person, you become identified with something, uh, perhaps you become identified with Christ, you become identified with judgment, you become identified, uh, one we may look at tonight if we get to it, with Moses. So you all, all, it's all about identification. A cucumber changes its identity when you put it in the vinegar and the spices and it becomes a pickle. So that's, that's the idea of baptism is to, to identify something or someone so, so completely with something or someone that they take on that characteristics of that person or that thing. So that's kind of the, the definition to keep in mind. That's kind of the working definition we'll use as, as we study through the scriptures and look at all the various baptisms. Um, and as I said last week, we went through all the baptisms, at least that, that I would be able to identify in Scripture, uh, there may be more, but we went through 14 of them. So what we're going to do is just take each one of those, sort of as they appear in Scripture, and and talk about each one of them. Talk about you know w w what is being baptized into what. What is the element of baptism? Is it water? Is it fire? Is it is it no? Or is it the Holy Spirit? What is the element? Uh, and then most importantly, perhaps, what is it being identified with? What is the person being baptized or the thing being baptized, what is it being identified with? And how is its identification changing when that baptism happens? So um, that's, that's kind of what the, the way we're going to do this. Um, if there are 14, I don't think it's going to take a week for each one. Um, but So it'll be whatever number of weeks it takes to get through the 14 different baptisms. Herb, Herb, Herb feels I am not speaking truth when I say it won't take a week for each one. He's he guffawed almost. <laughs> well, he went in the back row. I heard him there. So uh, it may take a week for each one, and if it does, obviously fourteen weeks. So, all right, let's go to First Peter. the The first one that we looked at last week, and the first one that we're going to look at um, in depth in our study is you know it, it's not exactly a baptism. It is a it is a type of baptism, and uh, it's it's found here in First Peter, but it refers us back to the earliest uh, of baptisms, which is the type of Noah being baptized. So 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 20. 1 Peter 3 and verse 20. <clears throat> which sometime were diso... Well, start at verse 19. By which he also, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So, uh, Peter talks about the, 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 the baptism, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth now save us, and the figure he's referring to is the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So, what does all that have to do with anything? Well, um, he, he ties what happened with Noah and his family, the eight souls that are saved in the ark, with baptism saving us. Saving us meaning the little flock in Israel. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us us. And of course that raises the question, does water and this is water baptism Peter's speaking of, does that water and, and we'll, we're not going to study the baptism Peter's speaking of there directly tonight because we will study it when we come to the, the baptism that Peter did, uh, repent and be baptized in Acts chapter 2. But tonight we want to look at what he's referring back to, that type of that baptism. And of course he says that the like the like figure whereunto even baptism doth now save us. Which raises the question, is baptism a, a salvation issue? Does baptism save? Peter seems to pretty, pretty clearly say that the like figure unto which baptism now doth save us. So is he saying there that water baptism saves the little flock? We know they were commanded, repent and be baptized. Is he saying that baptism saves them? Uh, well, to understand that, you've got to look at the type. What's the type? So go back to, to Genesis chapter 6. 
Genesis chapter 6. And the thing that's important, I think, to understand about the type, and we'll look at several passages about this, is that the, the salvation that's being talked about, the like figure now which baptism doth save us, and then he talks about Noah uh, and his family being saved by water, um, what they're saved from is not, what they're saved from is a physical judgment. And they're delivered physically. Not when he says uh, Noah is saved, he's not talking about Noah's salvation in the way that we think of the word. He's talking about Noah being saved out of the flood. Um, chapter 6 and verse 7 uh, of, of Genesis. And the Lord said, I will destroy men whom I have created from on the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, so Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord before the flood. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. So was Noah saved before the flood ever came? Yes. Yes, he was a just man. Um, we, we talked, when we studied through the terms of salvation, we talked about the term justification. And if you're justified, it means that God sees you as just. So Noah, before the flood ever comes, he's a just man. And there's two different things there. He's a just man. That's about Noah personally, and he's perfect in his generations. That probably has reference to the fact that, back up in verse 4, I'm sorry, verse um, 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Uh, verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children unto them, the, men, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So we're not going to study it in detail, but we know this is the sons of God, the angels, coming into the daughters of men, producing the race of giants, one of which, of course, was Goliath of Gath. He's one of those giants that's produced from the union between an angel and a human woman. And Noah, Noah is perfect in his generations. So that's probably a reference to the fact that Noah's bloodline was not stained by the, the, the sons of God coming to the daughters of men, which may mean that not only Noah, but his ancestors were just before God, because they had resisted the temptation of the sons of God and the daughters of men, and therefore Noah, Noah's generations were perfect before him, and therefore his sons, and his, his wife was, and his sons were perfect. So he's perfect in his generations, but also he's a just man. And the, and the last phrase in that verse, verse 9, and Noah walked with God. Again, an indication that Noah is a saved man, a just man. Before, the flood, before he's saved in the flood, he's saved. <laughs> so he's a saved man that's going to be saved out of a physical judgment and disaster that God is going to bring on the earth. Verse 10, And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the ark. So he's going to destroy the earth with the uh, 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 he's going to destroy the earth. He's going to destroy mankind. Uh, he's going to uh, make a way for Noah, though. Um, I will destroy them with the earth. Then verse 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood. And then he gives them the description of the ark that he's supposed to make. And if you go down to verse um, 17, and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So I'm making a covenant with you, Noah. And this covenant is a covenant to save them, save him, Noah and his sons and their wives, from the flood. And it's not a covenant to save their soul. Noah's already a just man, but it's a covenant, it's about the judgment that is to come. And Noah, I'm going to make a covenant with you about that judgment to save you out of that judgment. Um, in verse, or chapter um, 
7 and verse 1. Chapter 7 and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Just another verse. So, was Noah righteous before he was ever saved from the flood? He is. I see you as righteous in this generation. In this generation, you know, uh, that, that is, has corrupted their way upon the earth, I see you as righteous and just. Verse 23 of chapter 7, um, And every living substance was destroyed, which is upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things in the fowl of heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And that's the salvation. Noah and his family were saved. What is their salvation? Well, verse 23 defines it. They remained alive in the ark. It's not, it's not his soul salvation. It's not like when we ask somebody, are you saved? It's, it's the, the salvation of Noah and the salvation that's going to relate to that baptism of Peter, or John really, um, is about save salvation from a physical judgment that is to come. And just, because we're going to look at other verses that refer to it, go back to the beginning of chapter 6, and just uh, verse 3, the, the Lord said, I'm sorry, verse 2, The sons of God saw the daughters of men, they were fair. Uh, they took them wives of all which they chose, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also his flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them, the same were mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Um, this, this coming of the sons of God into the daughters of men is, is talked about uh, in the same context that Peter talks about the baptism and all. Go, go to, to uh, 1 Peter again, chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter is writing, you know, when we look at that, at that uh, event back in Genesis chapter 6 and 7, Noah is being saved from the judgment to come. If you look at what Peter's talking about in 1 Peter chapter 3 and some of the context of it, look up in verse 14. Uh, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But So he's talking about Israel suffering for righteousness' sake. Now, when is Israel going to suffer for righteousness' sake? In the 70th week of Daniel. They're going to suffer... For right, they're not going to suffer because they're evil, but they're going to suffer because they're righteous. So, so Peter's writing to a group of people and telling them, you, you're going to suffer for righteousness' sake, but there is a deliverance. And, and we'll get to that in a minute here. Verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be, ash be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. So you want to suffer for well-doing. If you suffer for doing something good, that's better than suffering for doing something evil. And, and, and as Keith answered, that's Israel in the time of Jacob's trouble, in the 70th week, where they suffer for well-doing, for not taking the mark of the beast, for following Christ, for doing the things he desires. Verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirits, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So it's interesting that, that when you know, he, he talks about, he's going to talk back to Noah, and what happened in the days of Noah? The sons of God came into the daughters of men. They produced this race of giants. Um, th th there was all this really weird stuff going on. And that's really why there was a flood. The flood wasn't just because man was evil. Because when did man start being evil? When Adam, when Adam sinned. Now, it does say every thought of his heart was only evil continually. So there's certainly a level of evil there. But 
But the flood is coming not just because man is evil, but because the human bloodline has been infected. The human bloodline has been infected with the, the seed, literally, of Satan. And so God needs to, and, and he had said, the reason for it, this is kind of getting off into the weeds here, the reason for it is because God said to the woman that, that her seed is going to crush the head of Satan. You, know, you shall bruise his heel, he will bruise your head. So he's, he tells the woman, your seed is going to defeat Satan. Well, what does Satan go after then? The seed of the woman. The sons of God come into the daughters of men and produce a race of giants, a literally a demonic race of giants. And so that's Satan's first attempt to keep the Messiah from coming. I'm going to destroy the seed of the woman and cause the seed of the woman to be corrupted. And, and that's what Peter points back to. The days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein, that, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved. God was long-suffering in that time, the 120 years we read about uh, back there in Genesis chapter 6. And, and verse 19, By which also he, Christ, went and preached to the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So he talks about the, 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 the disobedient spirits that were disobedient in the days of Noah. And Christ, when he died, he went to prison and preached to those disobedient spirits. Back to chapter 2 of First Peter. I'm sorry, ahead rather, to Second Peter chapter 2. Go in the wrong direction. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into change of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So it's interesting, Peter, and this is the point we want to get at here, Peter and James and John and, and, and all the, the circumcision epistles they're written in the context of the end times. And they're written in the context of the fact that, that the world is, is moving pow-mow to judgment. And God, in the nation Israel, God is trying to redeem out of that nation a remnant that will be delivered from that judgment. And, 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 and often they refer back to the judgment of the flood. They refer back to the judgment of those, those sons of God that came into the daughters of men uh, as, as a type of, I want to deliver you from that kind of judgment. The world was destroyed with water. I am going to come destroy the world with fire. Just as Noah and his family were delivered out of that destruction of water, I want to deliver my people, my remnant, out of the destruction of fire. And he keeps tying those two events together, uh, and he does so in, in 1 Peter with baptism, the like figure of which baptism doth now save us. So in 2 Peter, he refers back to that again, chapter 2, verse 4, If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into change of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment. Now, God spared not the angels that sinned. Uh, how many angels sinned, do, do we think? How many? A third of the angels sinned. But this is... Spe so the angels that sinned here is defined as cast them down to hell, deliver them into change of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Are all the fallen angels in chains reserved unto judgment? They're not, because in the earthly ministry of Christ, for example, what are the fallen angels? I mean, we call them commonly demons, but the scripture doesn't call them demons. The scripture calls them devils, and they are fallen angels. But some of the angels that sinned are reserved in chains of darkness. And we'll, we'll get a better definition of that in just a minute here. But verse 5 so God spared not the, verse 4, God spared not the angels that sinned. Verse 5, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. Bringing, so, so Noah, when did he preach righteousness? Before the flood or after the flood? Before. Before the flood. So when was Noah righteous? Before the flood, Before the flood ever came. 
And, and the point of that is the salvation that's being talked about here is not soul salvation, not the way we think of salvation. It's salvation from a judgment that is to come. Whether it's that judgment of the flood or the judgment of fire at the return of Christ. So, verse 5, He spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, and saved Noah, not soul salvation, but saved him from the judgment, uh, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample to those that should live ungodly, but delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. So, so again, he's talking about the judgment, and he compares the judgment that was back there in the days of Noah with the judgment that is to come on Israel. This is the book in the next chapter, chapter 3, where he says in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which heaven shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godless, godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So there was a judgment back here, and Noah and his family were saved out of that judgment. There is a judgment to come of fire when the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And I want you, Israel, to be saved out of that judgment in the same way that Noah was saved out of his judgment. Go to the book of Jude. Jude, that little tiny book that got stuck in before the book of Revelation. Um, Jude and has only one chapter. Jude, verse 6. So, so here he's going to define, you know, Peter talks about in, in 2 Peter, the angels that sinned, they're reserved in chains of, of, of darkness unto judgment of that, that day. Well, what, what angels were those? Verse 6 of Jude, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. So, so now we see a little better explanation. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left... Their, so what is an estate? Even today, what, what is an estate? It's a place where you live. It's a place where you live. It's, you know, especially if it's a big, fancy, we call it the estate. All right. So these angels kept not their first estate... They're heaven, were in the heavens. They, they didn't stay in their estate, the principality estate, but they left their own habitation. So if you leave the heavenly habitation, then where do you end up? Earth. On the earth. The sons of God came into the daughters of men. They saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they came into the daughters of men, and they produced this race of giants. So these angels, the, these judgment that he's talking about is of these angels that left their first estate. They are reserved in, in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them uh, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So uh, the, these, these uh, epistles uh, are all about the judgment that is to come, the judgment that is to come, the judgment that is to come. Not just about the 70th week of Daniel, which is the chastening wrath, but about the judgment, the purifying, punitive wrath that comes at the return of Christ. That's what these are all about. Um, look down into verse um, 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. These, these chapters and these books are about the judgment of God that is to come. And, and I love this verse. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. 
These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's uh, persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words that were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. So, so again, the warning is there's this judgment that is to come. There's a judgment that is to come. There's a judgment that is to come. You, you right now are being persecuted for doing good, and that's okay to be persecuted for doing good. Um, if you look back, uh, go back there to First Peter chapter three, and, and notice what he says, um, verse. 17 of First Peter 3 for it is better if the will of God be so, be so that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing why that contrast it's better now in the 70th week of Daniel to suffer for doing good when are people going to suffer for doing evil after the 70th, after the 70th week because after the 70th week the day of the Lord, keep your hand right there and just flip back to Isaiah for a minute. Isaiah chapter 13. Um, you know, Isaiah 13 is, is one of the passages that is a really good, clear explanation of what happens at the day of the Lord when the Lord returns. Verse 9 of Isaiah chapter 13. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. When the Lord returns, who gets destroyed? Sinner. The sinners get destroyed. Verse 11, And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogance of the proud to cease, lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. So that's the day of the Lord. That's the return of Christ. So what Peter is saying is, it's better for you to suffer now for doing good, than to not do good now, to not repent now, to not be a part of the remnant now, and to suffer for doing evil at the end. Because when the Lord returns, all those that do evil, all those that are wicked, all the sinners in the land, you're gone. So it's better to do good now, I'm mean, sorry, it's better to, yeah, to do good now and suffer for it, than to do evil now and get off scot-free, but when the Lord returns, then the evil is going to be punished. And that punishment is the final punishment, the punitive wrath of God. So, how does all this... So, so let's go back to that passage, 1 Peter chapter 3. So, you know, so with all that context in mind, verse 21, and he talks about Noah and Noah's being saved out of that that wrath that was coming, the like figure, verse 21, whereunto even baptism doth now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh. So the baptism is not putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, so if you look, skip the parenthesis, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So how does baptism save us? Well, first of all, in all the context we've looked at, what are we being saved from? Physical wrath. Noah, you know, uh, Enoch talks about the Lord coming in judgment to judge the wicked. What, what we're being saved, the baptism to save us from some kind of physical wrath. Go back to Matthew chapter 3. And look at John's baptism. And we, I don't want to go too deep into this because we're going to study John's baptism uh, when we get here. And, and we'll look, you know, do a little deeper dive into John's baptism when we get to Matthew chapter 3. But, but for tonight, in those days came John the Baptist, first chapter 3 verse 1, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John comes baptizing in the wilderness, or preaching, uh, John the Baptist comes preaching uh, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, down in verse 5, Then went out unto him Jerusalem and all Judea and the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. 
So we often view this baptism of John as being a, a salvation transaction. But if you, if you are understanding, if you're under, confessing their sins, it's the, a national thing, if you're understanding that, what could well be true of you to begin with? Did you already understand the kingdom is at hand? You already understand the kingdom is at hand. You are, it's like Daniel, when Daniel is captive and he reads in Jeremiah and he says, it's time for deliverance, I need to repent. And I Was Daniel a saved guy before he ever started repenting? Yeah. Sure he was. But he looks at the condition of the nation and he realizes the time has come for our our. our uh, captivity to end so I am going to confess the sins of the nation and he prays before God you know he, he anoints himself with sackcloth and, and oil and ashes and all that and he, he prays before God and says God we have sinned and done wickedly before thee had Daniel sinned and done wickedly before God no Daniel was he was an exemplary guy he was an upright guy in everything that he did he stood in the court of the king and spoke for God Almighty before King Nebuchadnezzar he was not he had not sinned but when he realized the time because he was a believer he is is confessing and acknowledging to God this is what my nation needs and, and if you put that overlay that in the context of Matthew 3 and, and if we, as we read the verses, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, who were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. It's 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 not so much a I'm going out to get saved. I'm going down to the river to get baptized to get saved. It's I'm going down to the river to get baptized to confess the sins of my people to God, like what Daniel did, because because judgment is coming. And and here's how you know that verse seven. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, why, when he saw Pharisees and Sadducees, I've always wondered this, I used to always wonder, when he saw Pharisees, if we were having a baptism today, and we saw a bunch of you know, false religious leaders coming down to be baptized, what would be people's reaction to that? Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There comes some Muslims, there comes some Roman Catholics, there comes some Jews, there comes some uh, heathens, there comes some Hindus, and they're all coming to be baptized. They're getting saved. But what's John say? John says, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You, see, you don't, you, you, you got to get it before you get my baptism. If you don't get what's going on here, you don't deserve my baptism. These people that are coming are coming because they already know what time it is. They already know the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They already know the nation needs to... They, they're coming because they're confessing the sins of the nation before their God. Not because they personally need it, but the nation needs it. And you scribes and Pharisees, you don't have any idea what's going on, what time it is, what the kingdom of God means. Who hath warned you? These people know about the wrath to come. So John's baptism, uh, go down, it, it, let's, let's keep reading at verse 7, verse 8. Uh, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So, so what's the, the, the end result? You know, then, then in verse 13, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized of him. And we'll look at that one when we get to it. But, but what's the end, the, the, last, uh, the last phrase that John says to those people that come to his baptism? He'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
That's at his return. That's the fire of judgment that comes at his return. So what's the baptism of John saving you from? Is it, is it saving your soul? Is it salvation like we talk about today? Or is it for some other purpose? It's, it's for the repentance. It's for the rebirth of Israel. And, and, and the rebirth of Israel allows them to be saved from what? From the physical physical fire, the physical burning of Jesus Christ's wrath. The wrath to come. So here's a question. And this is going to this kind of ties into what some of the discussions we've had about the end times. If you get baptized by John and you're a part of the remnant in the nation and you get saved from the wrath to come and you get saved from, you're not the chaff anymore getting burned up with unquenchable fire. Does that mean you're, so what is the wrath to come? It's when he returns in flaming fire. Taking vengeance. What's it not? What is not the wrath to come? The salvation. What are they all going to go through even though they're saved from the wrath to come? The, the rod of his anger. The rod of his anger. It's not the 70th week of Daniel. And the reason that's important because he says to these people, if you come to my baptism and you enter through the sheepfold of baptism into this remnant, you will be delivered from the wrath to come. Does that mean they're not going to go through the 70th week of Daniel? No. doesn't mean that. It means the wrath of God is not going to be poured out on you. The punitive wrath, purifying wrath of God. Why is that important? Keep your hand right here. And this is, this is kind of tying this into a current day uh, doctrine that we need to understand in 1st Thessalonians because many many will, will, will look at 1st Thessalonians and they'll say this uh, verse verse 9 of 1st Thessalonians 1 for they themselves show us of what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus which delivered us from what? The wrath to come. What is the wrath to come? Jesus Christ coming in flaming fire. Jesus Christ. So does that verse say anything about being delivered from the 70th week of Daniel? It doesn't. Because that's not the wrath to come. When, when John is preaching, and, and so when Peter says, the like figure of which baptism doth now save us. That baptism of John and becoming a part of that remnant. So what's, what is it identifying you with? When you go to John's baptism, what do you identify? Remember, that's the point of baptism. It identifies you. It changes you. Your character, your nature makes you identified with some something or someone or some group. So what does the baptism of John identify you with if you go to it? The little flock, the believing remnant in Israel. And as the believing remnant in Israel, fear not little flock, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the what? The kingdom. So are you going to taste of the wrath to come? No, no because it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And what, what Peter's saying, I believe, is that just like that ark provided salvation from judgment for Noah and his family, so those that enter the remnant in Israel through baptism, through John's baptism, they are delivered, it saves them from that wrath that is to come, the flaming fire, taking vengeance. So, so that's the parallel between the two. Noah and his family are in the ark and they're saved from the wrath that is to come. And through baptism and identification with the little flock, the remnant in Israel, you are, you, are, you are in that shelter, if you will, of the little flock and saved from the wrath to come. And that's how what happened with 
Noah and his family is a type of what's happening with the baptism of John, I think specifically, and you could maybe extend that to Peter, but we'll talk about that more when we go through them. That baptism of John, he's calling out that remnant. And that's why he's so his reaction when the Pharisees and Sadducees come is very important. Because he doesn't say, oh, thank God you're finally repenting. He says, you are a generation of vipers. You have no part in this baptism. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You're, you're loving this stuff, this, this backslidden condition of the nation. So he's not happy that they've come. He's there to identify through baptism the true believers in Israel. And these guys, the Pharisees and Sadducees, are not part of that. So they, don't, they stay outside the ark. They don't get in the ark. Only the true believers get in the ark and come to John's baptism. So, does anybody have a question? I have a comment. Okay. I think it's interesting when you make a comparison with Noah, Noah because um, in Luke 3, whenever the multitude came to him, uh, in verse 7, he says the same thing to the multitudes in Luke 7 that he says to the Pharisees in Matthew 3. And so the multitudes aren't ready. So That's he's right. He's a preacher of righteousness, and he starts converting the multitudes. But whenever he preaches to scribes and Pharisees, they just get us all they, to go away. Yep, yep. And so, just as Noah is a preacher of righteousness, John the Baptist was also. Yep, yep. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. John's message is very similar to Noah's. Yeah, and 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 just like in Noah's day, there were those those that were. You know, the sons of God and the daughters of men and all of that, the, the, the people produced from that, they're not going to repent. He, Noah's not, you know, he's, he's preaching, con the, the, you know, in fact, go to Hebrews 11. It's kind of interesting. We didn't, we should have looked at this. And I, I, I wanted to look at it and, and we didn't. Um, verse 7. Hebrews 11, 7. Um, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So again, that salvation is about what was his house saved from? The flood, the physical judgment that came. But then he says this, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. That he, he, Noah's, Noah wasn't trying to save the world. He was trying to condemn the world. And John is not trying to save those scribes and Pharisees. He came to condemn them. And this, this just like the, the, the world, those, those giants were not allowed in the ark. That was for Noah and his family. Those scribes and Pharisees, they weren't allowed in that sheepfold of water baptism. They, you, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You, you get out of here. You know, this is for people that really already understand what's going on. So Keith pointed out they're preachers of righteousness and in doing that they condemn the world. Noah condemned the world. John condemns in Israel that leadership in the nation. So in both cases they're preaching righteousness and condemning a big group of people. So yes Earl. Um, the giants such as mm -hmm. life, how did they come to be since they were after the flood? Was there another time that yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of it's it's kind of hinted at there in Genesis six, um, and of course remember Genesis is written, you know, later on, uh, and you know by 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 Moses, so it's not written contemporaneously with what's happening with Noah. Uh, verse four: There were giants in the earth in those days, that is the days of Noah. And also after that, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and bare children to them. So there were, there were in, in, in those days, and those were all killed off in the flood, and then after that, it happened again. But and then they were concentrated in the land of Canaan. Then they were specifically targeted at Israel. That's right. Yeah. And David, if you, I don't know the verse off the top of my head, but one of the things that King David did is he. He finished off all the giants in the land. He killed all the giants and drove them, you know, killed them and purified the land 
the land that God gave to Israel. Because the ones that came after that, as Keith pointed out, they're, they're, it's not all flesh. Because by that time, what does Satan know? He knows that Abraham has been promised the land. Yeah, it's not, and, and he knows the seed is not just going to come be the seed of a woman, it's going to be the seed of Abraham. So now he's, he's narrowing that down. It was the seed of a woman, it's the seed of Abraham, so I'm going to attack the seed of Abraham now. And, and, and all that went on in the land, and David drove them out of the land. Well, he didn't, no, I should, he didn't drive them out of the land, he killed them out of the land. <laughs> he destroyed them out of the land. He didn't drive them out, he killed them all um, and finished them off. So, so David, Goliath is not the only giant David ever had a part in killing. He killed all the giants in the land as he rose to be the king of Israel. Yeah. So there were more. The sons of Anak. It, it doesn't appear like, you know, they're, they're called the sons of Anak, so it might have been just one. You know, one, one son of God came into a daughter of man and produced these giants because they're called the Anakims which is the sons of Anak. So maybe there was only that one. Maybe just Anak was the only one. I, I don't know. Yeah. There's other names mentioned, but a lot of them are called the sons of Anak. So they could be descendants of Anak, I guess the others that are mentioned, maybe. But Goliath was one of them. He's called a giant. So there were giants in the earth in those days. And Goliath is called Goliath of Gath, a giant of Gath. So... You know, I just went and saw David here on Easter weekend. Oh. And I'll tell you at, what. At, something at Sight and Sound? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how they did this. <laughs> this character was huge. Yeah, yeah. Man, that's fabulous. That yeah. Fabulous. Well, nine and a half feet tall. Jared thinks my William is a giant, but I, <laughs> Goliath, I keep telling him, no, he was even bigger than that. So, <laughs> but. But, but to Jared, to Jared, you know, he's a big guy. So that's um, any other questions, comments, anything. All right. Next week we'll move into um, Israel's baptism unto Moses and and what's going on there with Israel being baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So, all right. Let's bow in a word of prayer then. Our God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking to your word and studying it together. And uh, we pray that as we go from this place that we would be living epistles of your mercy and your grace. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right.